I'm a bit of a, a different hire than, let's say, than many other technology CEOs. I can code, but I'm not a technologist or engineer. Um, I'm a, you know, for lack of a better word, a Wall Street or professional operator at this point. I know how to run marketing, sales, and HR, and how to make money, and, and those sorts of things. One of my proudest accomplishments is that we've grown about 30% of headcount over the last year and a half. There's obviously a lot of other tech companies have been in that fortune. Um, entirely bootstrapped, uh, so no venture capital ever since day one. Sure, so I'll, 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 I'll give a fun one. So within week one on the job, uh, we, I, I joined. I barely know anything about the company. Um, the ex-CEO is still coaching me through and teaching me about the organization, introducing me to people. And I realized we're paying, you know, $150,000 for sale, like a enterprise grade Salesforce license that none of our sales team is using. Sometimes that ran against the grade of an organization that's been, you know, running more or less the same way for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and certainly that required some change management uh, along the way, right? Initially, I think a lot of people were a little bit, a bit frustrated or scared by some of the changes I made. But now sitting here a year and a half later, they realize that, hey, when we're, we're, you know, we are, they're very happy about their job security, for example, because we have not had to do the mass layoffs that everybody else does. And they realize part of the reason is because we're a much better run business than a lot of other technology organizations. Welcome, everyone, uh, for another episode of Everyday Leadership. Uh, in today's episode, we'll sort of understand a, a CEO's top of mind. We'll sort of get into, you know, what goes behind the scenes of CEO's day-to-day -day, uh, life. Uh, and to do that, we have a very interesting guest today. We have Nick with us. Uh, Nick is the CEO of uh, Idea Scale, which is a SaaS company which sort of helps enterprises manage ideas better. Uh, but Nick, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, give us a, a bit of a context of who you are and how did you end up where you are today? Perfect, Pradeep. Thank you again for the invitation opportunity. So. As you mentioned, I'm the CEO of Ideascale. We've been around now about 14 or 15 years, and we're a SaaS company that makes what's called idea management software. So you can think of us as a CRM for ideas in the same way that any company would stick their customer data into a CRM like HubSpot or Salesforce, that we're where people put their idea data instead of on post-it notes or Excel spreadsheets. So we've been around 14 or 15 years. We have about 100 employees across six different countries right, right now, um, and we're very proud of the fact that we are a you know, profitable, growing company that has actually grown despite some of the challenges that have occurred in the tech industry over the last year. So we've actually, you know, one of my proudest accomplishments is that we've grown about 30% in headcount over the last year and a half, whereas obviously lots of other tech companies haven't been that fortunate. Um, entirely bootstrapped, uh, so no venture capital ever since day one. As for myself, I'm an external hire. I joined about a year and a half ago to take over from the founder who was moving on to other things. Um, so, uh, and my background is I grew up in a mix of Canada and India originally. We did my undergraduate in mathematics and physics at Dartmouth. Spent a bunch of time working on Wall Street as a professional investor in hedge funds and private equity. Uh, did my MBA at Harvard Business School. And then a couple of years after that, somehow I ended up in the job of professional CEO. So. This is the third company that I have either run or co-run. The first was a very large $150 million revenue, thousand person private equity owned company where I co-ran it. Then I ran it, helped run a, sh a sm small shoe startup as part of a three person leadership team. And now Ideascale is kind of a mid-sized organization that I'm hoping to take to the next level over the next couple of years. Um, so that that's my quick intro. No, that's awesome. That's a, a, a very interesting journey right there. It's can you can we talk a bit about idea scale, right? So I'm, I'm I haven't personally used a, an outside software to manage ideas. Um, can you just talk about is that really a problem that uh, uh, that exists right now, or if so, just give us a sense of uh, what idea scale is. What are some competitors in the space as well? Sure, and then so we'll go from that. It's a I, it's a reasonably young space uh, where I would say we are where. Uh, CRMs were in the early 1990s. In the early 1990s, people managed their CRM was a physical paper Rolodex. I don't know if you've ever seen it, where you stick business cards and spin it around. And that was the technology. And then folks like uh, Mark Benioff over at Salesforce and a couple other of his peers started creating these software solutions saying, why are we storing this data in paper? The same thing actually occurs today for ideas. For large organizations, again, if you're a 10 person grocery store where everyone works in the same room, you don't need software like ours. But if you are a thousand person organization across five different offices, several different countries or languages, you have all these really interesting ideas floating around a company and ideas could be as simple as how should, what are the new snacks that we need in the, uh, in the company office to what are the new menu items that a large, um, a fast food company might offer to its customers to what experiment does NASA want to run on a space station by soliciting the broader scientific community. 
And how do you collect these ideas from a broad array of people, sometimes inside the organization, sometimes external stakeholders, such as voters or an external scientific community? Um, how do you collect all of these ideas? How do you organize them? And then how do you select rank and, and figure out what the best ideas are? Um, so this is a real problem that organizations face. The way they solve it today is basically post-it notes. Uh, so like 3M is kind of a competitor of mine. Um, uh, Excel spreadsheets. Or in some organizations, they literally have a human being whose sole job is literally to be the aggregator of data. He or she is getting emails, slacks, Teams messages sent to him or her, and they sit and type that into Excel. And we are hopefully a much cheaper and much better technological solution to that problem. Again, no different than what CRMs did to uh, Rolodexes, I guess, 30 odd years ago now. No, oh, that is very interesting. And, and when you were brought in as an external hire, uh, generally when you are hired as a CEO of a company, how do you approach it? Like what's, what's, how, what's your playbook to just get started on a new job? Sure. So I'm a bit of a, a different hire, let's say, than many other technology CEOs. I can code, but I'm not a technologist or engineer. Um, I may, you know, for lack of a better word, a Wall Street or professional operator at this point. I know how to run marketing and sales and HR and how to make money and, and those sorts of things. Um, so I think there's a few things. Number one, when I was brought in, I had to be cognizant of the fact that I do have certain weaknesses, such as I'm not the best technologist and I needed to make sure that I had a strong team in place. And thankfully, I have a great head of engineering that, that really I can leverage his strengths because he is a technical expert and I can trust on him. Now, I obviously know, need to know a little bit about technology so I can kind of gut check what he's saying. But that's number one. I'm very cognizant of the fact that there's areas where I have extreme domain expertise, like I know how to run a marketing program or HR, and that there's areas where I'm weaker at and need to supplement that with strong other leaders. Number two is specific to idea skill. This is an organization that's been around 10 or 15 years. It's not a you know one year bootstrap startup that's worrying about making payroll, uh, reasonably established. So the good news is it, there's a bit of stability. The bad news when I joined is some of that stability was not necessarily the, big, the best uh, in class business processes that would allow us to scale. So I had to be kind of very cognizant of the fact that there's some bad practice in place, be what the solutions are that I wanted to implement were, whether those be technological people or process changes. Um, and then finally, rather aggressively implement those. And sometimes that ran against the grain of an organization that's been, you know, running more or less the same way for the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and, and certainly that required some change management uh, along the way, right? Initially, I think a lot of people were a bit, a bit frustrated or scared by some of the changes I made, but now sitting here a year and a half later, they realize that hey, we're, we're you know we're they're very happy about their job security, for example, because we have not had to do the mass layoffs that everybody else does, and they realize part of the reason is because we're a much better run business than a lot of other technology organizations. No, well, that is uh, you know awesome to hear. I mean, when everyone is laying off people, you seem to have added headcount, and which is such a uh, breath of fresh air. Uh, but could you talk about maybe one of those uh, improvements that you made? And is there uh, a success story on top of your mind that you can sure. share so with the I'll, viewers? I'll, I'll give a fun one. So within week one on the job, uh, we, I, I joined. I barely know anything about the company. Um, the ex-CEO still coaching me through and teaching me about the organization, introducing me to people. And I realized we're paying, you know, $150,000 for say, like a enterprise grade Salesforce license that none of our sales team is using. We have like, at that point, we had two and a half salespeople in the entire organization. We're paying $150,000 for software that nobody even uses because Salesforce is clunky. It's based on a, it's on a pre-cloud service. I immediately kind of said, we're canceling Salesforce. I contacted their sales rep and said, we're canceling this. Let's figure out the economics of that comp and implemented HubSpot, like literally myself, you know, skipped all the engineering and sales and marketing people and said, here, we're implementing HubSpot. I'm going to teach you guys how to use it, set up the integrations. And less than a week later, we were using it. And the cool thing is number one, HubSpot was, you know, 30% the cost of Salesforce, so immediately like 100 grand in savings, which is meaningful to an organization like ours. Number two, my team actually uses it and they don't, and they use it um, uh, uh, not because I'm ordering or demanding it, but because it's actually a better, simpler tool for the size and complexity of the organization as, the, as well as the processes that our sales team uses. So today, you know, back when we implemented, I had two and a half salespeople uh, and zero marketing people. Today, our sales and marketing organization is about 15, no, like 18 people or so. And almost uh, like, I, actually not almost all, literally all of them are using uh, HubSpot and technologies because they like it. I'm really happy about that because not only do we save money, but we built a better tool that makes our teams more effective and they enjoy using it as part of their daily workflow. And that's, by the way, what any good technology should do. <laughs> no, awesome. Awesome. That's a great story. And, you know, let's start with very basic. Like, can you just sort of give us a tour of what what your typical day is like? You know, how do you start your day and then how do you spend your day? and 
how do you sort of tackle, how do you manage your time and all of that? Sure. So my day is rather erratic, right? There's some days where I'm literally working zero hours. And there's other days where I'm working 24 hours because I manage a team spread across six to- uh, six countries at this point. Um, so the day is highly er- erratic just in terms of how hard I work or how many hours I work and when those hours happen to be. Um, but secondly, I think, uh, uh, at least for me, my concept of a CEO is I have three jobs. A, I hire the right senior leaders. Um, B, I create the right incentives and accountability structures for those senior leaders. And number three, I'm a pinch hitter when anything goes wrong. So God forbid, if, you know, one of our, our C, uh, account managers gets sick or gets hit by a bus, I should be there to cover him or her. Or conversely, if one of my engineers, you know, is out, I should be able to pitch and do some coding, do the marketing thing. So a lot of my day is actually not firefighting, but pitching in when somebody is stretched beyond capacity or unavailable to do something that is part of their core job. Or, or as teaching, right? So yesterday, uh, for or sorry, not yesterday, on Tuesday, for example, two days ago, a lot of my time is actually just spent mentoring a bunch of junior marketing personnel on how to do marketing analytics, because unfortunately, in their prior jobs, their bosses had not invested time in, hey, here's how you actually calculate the ROI of marketing tasks. So I was, uh, you know, a lot of my time was just spent teaching folks how to do that uh, two days ago. Nice. Uh, uh, and, and when you generally, uh, when you're trying to, how do you, have a pulse on the entire execution for for Zap. How do you know things are not falling apart when you're sleeping? Sure. So I'm a mathematician and scientist by trading. I love data and numbers. Uh, I have a uh, little folder tab on my browser, on, on my Chrome browser called Daily Reports. Uh, if you uh, if you click that and open up every tab uh, on, that is uh, or every bookmark that is in that Daily Reports folder, which literally I do as my first, it's to start my day. About 23, uh, no, like 17 different reports show up. How's my bugs team doing? How's my engineering team doing? How's my sales team doing? How's my marketing team doing? How's my website SEO traffic doing? How's my finance team doing? So I have, you know, 13 odd reports that pretty much give me a literally day by day pulse on both department level. And if I want to double click down at an individual level, so I could say that, you know, Joe is doing this well and Rakesh is doing this well in the sales team if I wanted, or I could just look at the overall sales team. Highly data driven, and that's literally how I start my day every single day. You know, seven days a week. If I'm if I'm looking at the data on Sunday morning as well. Awesome, and uh, and this is sort of my favorite question. And how do you ensure that you make all the employees working have a purpose and and they're sort of aligned with what you're trying to achieve this year's goals? And and how do you really foster a sort of a purposeful culture within within the company? Sure. I think there's three things. Number one, we try and do a, a good job at hiring good people. And by good, I don't just mean talented and productive, but also kind people, right? That are, you know, not toxic to the culture. The, you know, one of the few uh, uh, termination decisions I've personally been involved in was because that person was really significantly contributing to an unhealthy and unrespectful work culture. So we have a zero tolerance policy. We want high, you know, not only high performance, but people who are kind to one another so that we all feel that we're in this together, regardless of whether you're an engineer in Bangladesh, sales guy in South Africa, marketing person in the US, we are one team, regardless of where in the world you sit and what you look like. Um, number two is incentives. Pretty much every, and these are both soft and hard incentives. So hard incentives meaning money. Almost everyone's compensation is tied to the exact same metrics, whether it be mine or the junior marketing where we all care about the same things that matter for a software company. How are we growing? What is our customer retention rate? What is our profitability? So whether you're a bugs engineer or a CSM or a marketing person, you realize this is what matters to the business. And so you don't have any perverse incentives to like help marketing at the cost of engineering, for example, because you know, it's you're, you're hurting yourself and there's softer incentives like that as well. Um, and then finally is, is pitching in, right? I think there's a very strong understanding that when something goes wrong, if I myself am willing to roll up my sleeves and go, you know, fly to Dhaka and help design an in, you know, a new feature or, you know, do some marketing stuff because a marketing person is sick, people understand that this is not just, you know, an organization which has different levels and uh, hierarchical levels or different departments, but we are all truly one team when the CEO is literally willing to roll up his or her sleeves and do the grunt work that is necessary, including, you know, data entry. Right, the lowest level manual data entry I you do actually on a regular basis, partially because I want to show people this is important and I'm willing to do it, so you should be as well. I see. And and do you like you know how do you set up uh, the cadence for the company? As in, do you have like quarterly goals, or do you have or you use frameworks like OKRs and KPIs and what kind of cadences do you have to achieving goals and to execute on a regular basis? 
Sure. So we have we have a general kind of one year plan. Um, we're we're a bootstrap company. We don't have a venture capital board, which you know, the plus side means I don't have to worry about weekly bu bureaucratic or quarterly updates uh, the, to venture capital or PE board members. Which, by the way, I've, you know, I was PE guy for most of my career, so it's great that I don't spend most of my time making powerpoints for a board that is disengaged. Um, and my owner is a very long term thinker, so it's great that I can we can create a one year plan and really focus on that. Um, I think there's three types of things that occur in terms of measuring. So, sorry, number one, we don't have a like quarterly plan or monthly plan. That's by design because I don't want to be focused on what happens today, but rather build a business over uh, the next five years. Number two is on actually assessing our progress to the plan. There's two levels. Number one, as I mentioned, highly I'm highly data driven, so, and that data is actually visible throughout the entire organization. So my dashboards, the junior most personnel in the company can see if he or she wants. Um, so, but that is reviewed daily, but as well as monthly, we do, you know, we do monthly and financial reviews of how the company's done, not just of like, you know, our profit and revenue, but Hey, how is our net retention rate? How is our bugs? And this is posted publicly to the company. So they know that, Hey, we had a great month or we had a bad month because our bugs spiked up and our customers are pissed at us or they're very happy. Um, and those obviously then ultimately translate into hard incentives to uh, hold ourselves and account, uh, ourselves accountable, including me, right? Again, I'm paid the exact same way as every other person's organization. So if we miss our monthly quarter early or annual goals, either hard goals or soft goals, then we are all suffer or succeed together. Nice. And, uh, you know, it's, it's such a dream setup, right? So you have this SaaS product, which is completely bootstrapped and without any yes, external I, capital. I, I walked into a very fortunate situation. <laughs> I do want to give credit to, to my predecessor and founder, Rob uh, Hohen, who built this company and was able to do this because truly tremendous accomplishment to bootstrap a company for 10 years. Absolutely. And, and you know, you had so many customers and then, and then you have such, you know, being an enterprise also comes with the blessing of being having those sticky users. Uh, so you can really, you know, uh, have some breathing space as you are building new features and whatnot. There's all this good stuff on one side, but at the same time, how do you see innovation? Like, how do you see threat? Like, there could be any other company trying to really build what you built in, you know, now is like the AI times that, that have arrived. How do you see the competition and what's your, what's your strategy and a playbook if you have one uh, to tackle competition? Sure. So I have, you know, there are about 10 or so competitors, uh, Bright Idea, Wazuku, QMarks, that are all great competitors and I respect them and they do, you know, similar, different flavors of what we do. They exist and they're good competitors. I'm, you know, happy to be in a space with them. The good news is the space is still na nascent or greenfield enough where all of us can grow without butting heads too much. But then, so there is active competition. In terms of the new emergent technologies, whether it be AI, at least, you know, all forms of generative AI that exist today still act in a co-piloting manner with a human being where they augment a human being's productivity, whether that be creatively, how fast you can write code, how fast you can write sales emails, whatever that is. And, you know, for all we know, in five or 10 years, there may be AI that truly like replace a human being, but at least today, AI is augmentative to a human being. And that's how both software companies like ourselves, as well as customers view it. So for our perspective, you know, some of these generative AI technologies, we built it into our tool so you can co-ideate with an AI tool. So uh, actually, the best the, the best feature we found was uh, when people are sharing their ideas on our platform. One of the biggest thing, people problems is people get stage fright. They're like, "Hey, am I expressing my idea eloquently to my peers, or am I going to look stupid because I didn't, you know, use fancy uh, five dollar words?" But if you, the AI can help you take your idea and just write it more eloquently, then that's a great thing that gets rid of stage fright for you people. So, at least in the near term, I view you know I, I have direct competitors. But I'm not viewing disruption by um, any of the new technologies. Um, the, you know, my biggest competitor for the most part is Excel on paper. Uh, and for the, uh, for the most part, I believe I can replace that with a better technology at a lower cost than, uh, than, than you know, the, inc the incumbent paper and Excel solutions. Nice. Yeah, that sort of makes sense uh, because this is very sort of human contribution sort of driven product and human creativity ideas sort of aspect, which I think... Is uh is unlike very other uh, data driven question answers bot kind of setup, uh, but that said, if I want to ask you, you know, what are some challenges that you've seen as you started scaling this company or executing it? Can you recall any execution challenges? Sure. So I'll mention kind of two. Number one, when I joined, we were uh, a year and a half ago. We were primarily a U.S. company with large Dhaka, Bangladesh office. Um, and they're come, become naturally when you have two centers of operation, um, you have cultural differences, time zone differences, language differences, 
Uh, and that's certainly been an issue that we've had to navigate, especially as we've expanded to other countries to realize, like, regardless where in the world you sit, we are one team. Um, and part of the way we've navigated that is historically, Taco is our engineering office in the U.S. was our sales and marketing office, but we've actually hired technical personnel here as well as sales and marketing personnel in Taka. So it's much more, you know, uh, two centers of equal operation rather than uh, a departmental specialization. That's number one. Um, number two is the the ways you run a effective or efficient organ or high performing organization are, are there's very particular ways to do that. And uh, a lot of folks who are working at small organizations like ours have never worked at a high performing organization like a Goldman Sachs or a Blackstone or McKinsey and introducing the, some of the processes that those organizations use. Like the reason private equity firms make billions of dollars is because they know how to you know, run companies effectively. Implementing some of that certainly encounters a bit of cultural challenge at organizations like ours where people have never worked at Goldman Sachs and don't know why is Goldman Sachs Goldman Sachs. It's not because of a brand name, it's they actually know how to run a company. So th there's a different way to run HR, different way to run technology, different way to run automation, the way you manage your finances, the way you hold people accountable. And that's certainly a challenge to, to bring in and implement and enforce an organization like this, because that is not built into the DNA of the individuals who often end up working, at least early in their careers at places like us. Nice. And and that's sort of uh, a nice segue to my next question as well, right? So, so you have a pretty much an empty playground and you don't have any VC pressures or public markets pressures. So you're in a pretty safe space. Now you can go anywhere from here, right? So you can add more horizontal features. Now you now that you managed to get into an enterprise, they're using your idea, maybe add maybe another new feature, whatever it is. Like you can horizontally keep adding products. Or you can go ballistic and start bringing in more and more enterprise enterprises or more, maybe go down the market, right? So go from enterprise to mid-market and maybe SMB and, and whatnot. So how do you play this sport going forward? Sure. So we have three, you're exactly right. We're in a very, very fortunate situation where most, you know, I have good competitors, but all of us have the opportunity to grow in this area. Um, there's th For us specifically, there's three vectors which we started growing. In. Number one is investing more in our traditional US and Canada business. Last year, at the beginning, January of last year, we had a one and a, sorry, 2.25 FTs in sales and marketing total, and they were just focused on the US. So we've actually invested a lot more. Now I think for the US and Canada specifically, we have four sales reps plus uh, two or three marketing people. So we've significantly invested just growing in our core market in terms of headcount, money, marketing resource, whatever. Number two is the international expansion. So we've added sales and marketing personnel in India, Dhaka, or sorry, sorry, um, in India, South Africa, uh, Mexico, and we're hiring for Brazil right now um, and soon for Europe as well. So we've expanded internationally, same product, but basically doing the same thing that we're doing in the US and Canada overseas. And we, our early data is actually some really good success. We won some of the biggest banks in Southeast Asia already. And then finally is the, is the new products or modules. So our core product was an idea management solution, but there's two adjacent spaces. One is whiteboarding for unstructured thinking or collaboration with folks and, uh, and project management. And so we, we launched our whiteboarding product reasonably recently, a few months ago. Um, and we're coming out well, on a free version and then the public, the paid version, commercial version is coming out hopefully Monday actually. Um, and then we'll be adding a project management solution in a few uh, later this year. So basically any client of ours can go from an unstructured whiteboarding solution where you're just bouncing an idea uh, back and forth between your colleagues to putting into a structured idea management solution or C idea CRM. And then once you've iterated and figured out what the good ideas are from the thousands of, you know, mediocre, potentially uh, okay ideas, how do you move that into a project management solution? Um, you know, you, you can certainly do that with Jira or some of the other solutions that exist, but we're hoping that our own kind of inbuilt solution will integrate more natively and be more appropriate for our organizations or for our customers. No, well, that's, that's pretty exciting lineup there. And generally, who are your customers? Like what, what, what markets are you, is your sure. presence in? So about two thirds of our business right now is government is government related, U.S. federal, state, local governments, and about one third is private sector organizations. And that's mm -hmm. mostly that that's what is mostly due to the fact that we grew out of an Obama area initiative. President Obama had back in two thousand eight or two thousand nine and said government needs to be more innovative. Our founder said, "Hey, this is a business opportunity. Let's build a business." And so we had some early success in a government that we've continued to build upon. Um, but pretty much any government organization, you know, the public ones I can disclose is we've done work with NASA, Coast Guard, um, uh, some of the, the, the Department of Labor. There's a whole bunch of organ very large or organizations, both at the federal and state and local level at the U.S. Uh, that we've done. Um, 
as well as I think with the Australian, put one of the big police departments in the, in, a, in one of the states in Australia. Um, and then on the private sector, pretty much uh, our business there is pretty much industry agnostic. Whether you're an oil company or a finance company or a healthcare company, you still need innovation, right? Whether that be product innovation, internal operations innovation. Um, so we have uh, we have customers literally across every you know subsector or vertical within the private sector, as well as across different geographies. Now that we started that international expansion. Nice. I'm I'm pleasantly surprised how much traction you guys managed to acquire. What business? Uh, two thirds, you, as you mentioned, two thirds of your customers come from the government. And and could you talk about an example in terms of how the value mm -hmm. add comes from using this product? Maybe from a real world example where someone you know used your product to really innovate and sure. Achieve. So I can't name this client because of obviously NDA reasons, but one of the biggest fast food chains in the United States is something I'm sure you've eaten at at some point, you know, probably in the last week, uh, wanted to refresh their menu. And they were, they have all these chefs and professional cooks and chemists in the house, but they were like, Hey, we don't have any great ideas for what the next big sizzler item on our menu should be. So they said, let's ask our customers, let's go talk to the 300 million Americans and probably hundred million people overseas who eat at our restaurants and franchisees. Let's see what great menu ideas they come at. So they solicited thousands of ideas for what that next burger item or taco item or chicken sandwich should be or type of soda should be. Got thousands of ideas from their, uh, from their end customers like you and I consumers who go buy Happy Meals or Big Macs or whatever. Um, or, or, um, or, you know, Wendy's, whatever it's called. Uh, that, that smoothie, I always forget. Uh, but uh, so they got these ideas and this had two benefits. Number one is they got outside their own heads. So you're not just talking to the professional chef in house, but you're talking to your customers and you're, so you're getting new, fresh ideas that you wouldn't otherwise get if you're an echo chamber. But number two, it has a huge engagement benefit. Customers feel emotionally more connected to any brand uh, that listens to them. And this is not just true at a consumer level. If you're an oil company and you are listening to what your refiners are saying downstream, that's the refiners are probably care because they run into a lot of problems based on the raw Un, uh, unrefined oil that you know Exxon is sending, for example. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Now, now, and they now did I... launch that product menu, but uh, they did launch that new item, by the way. So exactly. they got these, you know, thousands of ideas from their customers. They did some filtering, figured out what was excitable and actionable, and then released it. And, and I don't have the hard data on it, but I think it was a reasonable success. No, I, I, I'll have to guess. You don't need to acknowledge my guess, but I guess it has to be McDonald's because they, they went through some not. change. I, I it just is not. Gave, I just gave too many. <laughs> I, I'm personally a McDonald's fan, so it is not actually McDonald's, but uh, I, I just gave too many McDonald's examples because yeah. that's you know top of mind is the biggest franchise. <laughs> I see. But now as you sort of explain it, I sort of get the, get the problem that you know needs to be solved here because when you have thousands and hundreds and thousands of ideas, how do you accumulate it? How do you really make sense out of it? I think, I think precisely that's where the uh, where the problem is for many people. And uh, well, that's nice. And uh, let's talk about. I think we're almost at the end of. Uh, we have two more segments to go. Let's talk about hiring and firing. So, can you give us your take in terms of hiring? So, what do you look for when you want to hire new people? Sure. So, whatever position. Our hiring process is extremely regimented, whether you're applying for a marketing position in the US, an engineering position to hawk a salesperson in South Africa, it's the exact same engineering process. Stage one is a skills-based uh, is a skills-based test. We know, we want to tech test that you have some basic math, reading, critical thinking skills, the ability to use the internet, like tools that are just essential if you are doing an information service job. So everybody in the company, you know, will do this. And for a typical position, we may have two, three, five hundred people. Fill out, do a basic skills assessment regardless. Um, we want to know you can do math regardless whether you're in marketing or engineering or sales or the CEO or whatever, uh, or read or know some basic facts. Um, number two is the HR interview or the fit interview. Um, we want to make sure that even before we worry about your, you know, the tech, the skills or, or experience you have for the specific job, that you are a cultural fit for this organization because we, again, take that very seriously because we're, again, we're small enough where one bad apple can can uh, can spoil uh, the company. So the second is the HR interview where you chat with one of our HR people. And then finally, it t tends to be the hiring manager or skills based interviews with the uh, with the individual. So that could be the head of sales. That could be your, your local engineering manager, uh, depending on obviously the role you're applying for. And that's the same process every customer goes into or every uh, applicant goes into. Um, 
on the hiring side, on the performance management side, I don't think we're particularly, dis- I do th- sorry, actually, let me back up. I think our hiring process is probably more regimented and scientific than most organizations. Again, it's because I stole what Goldman Sachs or McKinsey or, you know, high performing organizations do. Um, uh, number two is on, I think on the performance management stuff, we are probably not, uh, we're probably very similar to any other organization. We do reviews, incentives, bonuses. Uh, we track KPIs for employees or at least managers do um, at, at the employee level. Um, and then finally, on the firing side, uh, again, I've been in a fortunate position where we have not had to do any layoffs due to cost or, or, or reasons or et cetera. Um, our terminations are really due to kind of uh, ever uh, two things. Number one is you're not a good cultural fit or it's actually worse than that if you're toxic to the culture. It's not we don't use that as a euphemism. If you are toxic to the culture, you don't belong here. And we make that very clear to folks. Um, the second is uh, performance. And what I think for performance, our standard is you can't just be not bad. You actually have to be good at your job. A lot of organizations leave employees in place that are, they're okay at their jobs. Just the definition is they're not bad. So let, why terminate them? Here, the standard is you actually have to be good at your job. And that's for two reasons. Number one is if if you if you are a high performer and you look out around the organization and see that, hey, Nick next uh, sitting next to me is just okay. And why is he you know still around? Why, why am I working twice as hard? Um, that, that creates a bad culture. And number two, because the, an organization really depends on every employee, the fact that there's a few underperformers actually drags down the productivity of the entire organization. I need all my engineers, all my salespeople to be pushing because ultimately if it's a, a, por- a portion of people are less effective. It affects the growth and success of the rest of the organization, right? I can't have a couple bugs engineers doing poor bugs jobs because that affects the entire rest of the sales organization. My customers will get a buggy piece of software which oh. obviously would be unacceptable. <laughs> completely, completely agree. Well, so with that, so we've arrived at the last section of this part and as part of my last segment. So I have a couple of rapid fire questions. Sure. And uh, my quest, first question to you is, what is that one favorite book that you would recommend uh, to other people? Uh, my, one of my favorite books, uh, The Foundation Series by Isaac Asimov. Uh, I'm a big science fiction writer uh, and I've been trying to make it through the famous books uh, there. So Foundation was just a fun book, nothing super intellectual, but enjoyable, makes you think about what the world could be you know, a hundred or a thousand years from now. Nice. And, and uh, who is, who is your favorite entrepreneur? Um, my favorite entrepreneur, uh, I think would be uh, Peter Thiel. So if you look at Peter Thiel's background, um, uh, I almost want to say Elon Musk, but that's, I think, boring. My reasons aren't interesting. Uh, Peter Thiel is great because he had a great career as a Wall Street lawyer, then launched a very successful business and then has launched a, a venture fund. So he's had multiple stages of his career where he's taken what he's, he's taken some skills. Like I think Peter Thiel went to Stanford. It's a very smart guy, went to Wall Street, became a great M&A lawyer, then said, hey, I've learned all these skills in, in big corporate America. Let's apply them to build a, a, um, a payments company in the early days of the internet. Okay, that's been successful. Now let's take all this money I've made and apply those skills to helping organizations succeed. And you know, obviously he's founded one of the best venture funds out there. And I love people who can, who aren't just one hit wonders, but actually can do multiple things and translate the skills to that next stage of their career, their, their next venture, whatever that is. I know. Also, my, uh, I love uh, Zero to One. I think that's one book mm-hmm. that you can yes. keep reading <laughs> as many times as you want. And uh, <laughs> finally, um, what is that one life hack that's sort of helping you live a better life? Sure. Um... At a personal level or at a professional level? Sorry. It could be anything. It could be personal level as well. Uh, actually, maybe it's the same answer for both. I try and do things that uh, in life that only make me happy. Um, so I try and take jobs that actually give me joy. I like being at idea scale. I like the fact that I'm building a company and creating jobs. You know, in marriage, I love my wife, right? I like that I have two cats. I like the house that I live in. It's not the fanciest place in the world, but the things that I only do things that give me joy. Um, so I try and avoid all the trappings that people get into that, hey, you're going to buy a fancy watch because it's expected of you. That doesn't give me joy. I don't have a fancy watch. Um, so almost everything in life I do is literally something that I truly love from deep down and and that reflects who I am as a person. Awesome. Good. Love love hearing that. Well, uh, thank you for being on the pod, Nick. Uh, really appreciate you sharing, you know, all those great insights in, about your, you know, day-to-day job and about idea scale. Wishing all the best to you and Idea Scale. Hopefully, it'll scale and scale and scale. And uh, you know, the next by the end of this year, hopefully, you know, you'll be at a place where you want it to be. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind words uh, and the well wishes. I genuinely appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for the. Absolutely. Thank you.